Hi, this is Ash Whitener. And this is Justin Blinko. And welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. On December 4th and 5th, we went to Mexico City to interview some of the brightest entrepreneurs in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference. We left with a number of amazing interviews, and we're really excited to share one of them with you today. Please help us out by following us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes with links and contact info to everyone we speak with can be found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. If you want to save 5 to 20% off of everything at Amazon using Bitcoin and support Liberty Entrepreneurs with no cost to you, check out the show notes at libertyentrepreneurs.com and sign up for an account with purse.io using our affiliate link. Welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. We are still at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference in Mexico City, Mexico. Today we have Trace Mayer with us. He's an entrepreneur, investor, host of the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, is a lifestyle designer trying to create the optimal human experience and live epically. Trace, welcome to the show. Oh, glad to be here. We've been discussing a theme of being your own personal life CEO. Can you tell us a bit more about that and how you got into that mindset yeah so you know the ceo at the end of the day the buck stops with with the ceo if the marketing doesn't get done if the accounting doesn't get done if the toilets didn't get cleaned at the end of the day it's the ceo's responsibility and one thing that i think we're seeing in society so much is everybody just wants to shift the blame to somebody else like if they're not healthy if they're not if they don't have enough money if they're not happy they want to put the blame for that on somebody else instead of where it belongs and where it belongs it belongs with you nobody cares more about your health nobody cares more about your wealth than you do as an individual so i mean you got to step up and take responsibility or you're just gonna continue having problems yeah so what is a lifestyle designer and what are your goals you know, when we look at what motivates us, uh, there's a book by Dr. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi called Flow, and he, he goes into like what actually uh, motivates humans to do things, and it's this concept of flow. It's why you know artists uh, engage in their art. It's why a lot of people engage in the work. It, it releases a bunch of different neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, all of this stuff gives us this feeling uh, that you know that we have this kind of purpose to it and so I think it's getting into flow like finding activities that get us into flow on a regular basis and doing it in a healthy way you know that's really what what we need to do in order to optimize our human experience so trace based on your recommendation I recently read flow you spoke about that on your, your podcast which I highly recommend that our listeners check out the Bitcoin knowledge podcast if you're any bit interested he's got a lot of great guests can you tell us a little bit about what are the pillars that make up flow? How do you achieve that in different aspects of your life? Well, there, there were a bunch of uh, rules that Dr. Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi was able to figure out. You know, he interviewed 10,000 plus people, looked at the different common elements, like what got him into flow, things that did it. So, I mean, you really need to read the book and, and figure out the rules that govern getting into flow. Uh, What I like to do in terms of designing my lifestyle, though, is I put it into four big categories. There's health, wealth, uh, experiences, and relationships. And so I like to architect or design those different aspects of my life to put me into flow on a regular basis. Let's get into a little deeper detail for health. What particular tactics are you instigating? First... I guess I'd let's turn the table, right? Because I, I do podcasts too. Would you sell your your health? Like how how much how much would it take to pay you to be in a wheelchair for the rest of your life? I don't think there's a price that I would pay you, Ash. No, no, definitely no. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and yet people eat crappy food. They they you know they might smoke cigarettes or drink alcohol. Me personally, I don't smoke. I don't drink. Why? Because I value my health so much. Because like. You know, if and your health is really composed of both your physical health and your mental health. And so, you know, anything that infringes on or or decreases my ability to have those two 
aspects of myself, I, you know, I just, I shun them. So, you know, I, I eat very high quality food on a regular basis. I take a ton of different supplements. Uh, I do a lot of stuff, both in terms of biohacking and also mind hacking or, or increasing one's cognitive abilities. Uh, all this stuff, you know, I think those are kind of the pillars for, for the health, uh, aspect of designing our life. And we have to have that designed. Otherwise, everything else doesn't matter. I mean, you can be the richest guy in the world and you can't enjoy the sunset because you're in pain. Like that's not any fun. And at the end of the day, you can enjoy the sunset just as much as Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. As CEO of your life, what dividends has this paid? So, you know, you've, you've taken a lot of time to focus on this and really learn the, the, the basics. Has this changed your life radically? Were you doing this already before and this just kind of made it more concrete? Well, I think I've always kind of, you know, just sought to be my best self. I saw I saw a statue once. It was this guy chiseling himself out of a block of stone, right? And I was just like, man, that is so cool. <laughs> um, not that, but I guess I've kind of grown a little bit more. You know, I don't think we we're totally self-made in that sense. I think that we have so much that's given to us by other people. You know, we're we're we we have so much investment made by other people in us. You know, starting with our parents, uh, siblings, other family members. You know, so getting getting back to like the health you know, it's paid huge dividends. You know, I, I, I like to run, I like to do pull-ups and push-ups and I have a kettlebell. So that's kind of more on the physical side, uh, on the mental side, uh, there, there's actually an app called IQ boost for the iPhone. It's free. Professor Jagie's study found that this dual in back training had a permanent effect of raising fluid intelligence, which is basically general IQ previously thought to be pretty much unalterable. You know, so you can basically make yourself as smart as you want to be. Once you start increasing and raising your IQ and you're able to make more of those connections, well, guess what? Now you're able to uh, connect the dots a lot faster. You're able to learn a lot faster. You know, and knowledge and power and is power. And so you're able to learn a lot of this stuff. And so in terms of different substances, you know, I, I like to eat really high quality food. I eat a lot of kale. I eat a lot of broccoli. I take cold showers. Why do I take cold showers? Well, you know, I can afford to take a warm shower, but I like the choice of turning the, the water cold. I like making myself uncomfortable. Do you start cold and it's cold the whole way or do you start warm and then, and then transition? Because I've just started and I can only, I, I start warm and then I finish with cold, but I, I haven't been able to do a, a full shower cold. Like I, usually I start warm and in in cold, I guess that's how James Bond did it in his books, right? The Scottish shower. But you know, I want to get to the point where I can like go freaking swimming around in the polar ice caps like Wim Hof. I mean, and Wim Hof, I mean, he's, he's an unbelievable inspiration, but he says being uncomfortable is when you don't have control over your situation. That's when you're uncomfortable. The reporter asked him like, this is, this is like 32 degree water. Isn't it cold? He's like, I don't feel the cold. I feel the power. He's able to will himself to be warm. And it's actually because you're activating the brown fat and that, that burns 30 times as much energy as your usual cells that you're actually able to heat yourself. He, he's got direct control over his nervous system and, and his immune system. They inject him with all types of bacteria and stuff. They have no effect on him. He doesn't get sick. Why doesn't he get sick? Because of the power of his mind. You know, we, we, have to, we have to take control of our body, our mind, our thought patterns, our thought processes, all of this stuff, if we want to live an optimal life. And it takes a lot of discipline and it takes a lot of willpower to do that. Yeah, I really like that. You know, it ties back into being the CEO of your health. If you're conscious and aware enough to notice, oh, my stomach's hurting. You know, what is that telling me? What is that pain telling me? Just like an entrepreneur will sense a pain in the marketplace and try to solve it. You are the CEO trying to find the pains in your own body, thus making you stronger. It doesn't matter how much wealth or your experience and stuff you have. If you don't have your health to continue to live a full and prosperous life, then, you know, you're the CEO that should be fired. So talk to us a little bit about the wealth aspect of the four pillars. I like to eat really good food. I like to take a lot of uh, supplements. You know, I take uh, lion's mane mushroom, for example. It uh, clinically proven to regrow your nerves and it can put past the blood brain barrier so it regrows your brain cells. That's, you know, it's like 30, 60 bucks a month, right? You got to have wealth. 
you got to have wealth in order to buy, you know, nice grass fed steaks and to buy broccoli and to buy, buy organic kale and to buy alpha brain. I love, uh, you know, al- I really like alpha brain, although I like lion's mane mushroom a little bit more because it's more benign. I like benign type supplements. Um, but you got to have wealth. And in order to have wealth, you know, I kind of look at it, you got to have six flags. You, you got to have your residency in one place. You got to have citizenship in another place. You've got to have uh, you're spending your time in a third place. You have your bank account in like a f- in a fourth place. You've got your investments in a fifth place. You've got your digital life in a in a sixth place. And you use the legal jurisdictions in order to insulate yourself from people who might try to disrupt your lifestyle design. It's part of taking that control. I got this concept called junction points. Uh, in New York City, you know, the city is just so loud and obnoxious uh, a lot of the time. And one of the strategies that they use to in the building in order to have the quietness and the habitableness that you need is they'll build a building inside of another building. And they'll actually connect the inner building to the outer building at only a very few junction points. Well, if we design our life in a way that we're connected to the world at large at only very few of these junction points, now we've got ourselves in a much more defensible position. We, we've got con- control and defense in our in our position. Hey, you got everything in bank accounts in, in one particular country, like the U.S. with civil forfeiture? Yeah, guess what? Cramp, you know? And, and it could be a complete accident. You know, it could be a victim of identity theft, and yet they freeze all your accounts, right? And throw them in the civil forfeiture fund, which are now the, one of the top three sources of revenue for each of the states. What a what a pain in the neck, right? But if you've got stuff divvied up and, and placed all around in different places and you're using Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin's great in that sense because it gives you control at the root level uh, of your, your wealth. Yeah. And controlling your health is very important. And I, I think more people think about controlling their health, even if they don't act on it, than controlling their wealth. Like you said, the Six Flags approach. Like how many people, even our listeners who are extremely intelligent, you know, probably libertarian oriented or entrepreneur oriented, you know, how many of them have residency in another country? How many of them have a bank account in another country? Or how many of them even know how to secure their digital goods and their digital assets? That, like you said, that lack of control is going to be what makes you nervous. And any good CEO wants to control his business and wants to start recognizing where he can be stronger in his own internal business. Yeah, and that's going to lead to experiences. A lot of, you know, very optimizing experiences, you know, they can take money. My buddy, my buddy Kevin, we do a lot of stuff together. Uh, you know, we, we go to uh, different entrepreneurial events. The next one coming up, it's 40000 bucks. Richard Branson's private island. I'm actually not going to be going to this one, but, it, you know, it's really kind of cool. As my dad says, we like to discriminate the old-fashioned way with money. You know, when, when you're hanging around with a lot of other high-producing, high-quality people, entrepreneurs, yeah, they, they tend to have money. Like, I, I actually spent six weeks in Thailand with 21 other entrepreneurs. We rented a villa, and 21 entrepreneurs all descended on this villa. We had full-time chef, full-time maid, full-time massage person. We had all these motorbikes. We were going out and, like, swimming with the whale sharks and and other stuff. We are coming home, working on our businesses. But in order to have an experience like that, you've got to have freedom. You've got to have health freedom. You've got to have financial freedom. You've got to have time freedom. You've got to have location freedom. All of that stuff takes a lot of discipline, a lot of effort in order to carve out in this life. And there are a lot of forces at work out there that want to tie you down to a jurisdiction. Yeah, but I mean, if you're tied down to a jurisdiction, you're much, you are much more easily controlled by whoever else wants to try to control you. It's a lot easier to, to milk the cow when the cow can't leave the stall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and also easier to turn them into hamburger. For sure. That is for sure. Before we started recording, you mentioned, speaking of experiences, that you just went on a John Lee Dumas cruise about podcasting. I would love, John Lee Dumas, if you're listening, contact me. I would love to be on the next one of these cruises and learn. Can you give us just some of your experiences on that cruise? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was a lot of fun. We got to uh, we got to hang out with uh, a lot of the top podcasters. I went because I wanted to get some training, figure out what I should do with my podcast because, you know, my podcast has mainly just been a hobby. You know, I see all my friends at 
Bitcoin conferences. And so, hey, and I've been asked so much like, man, if I could just be like a fly on the wall when you're having coffee with some of these people, not I don't even drink coffee, but, uh, you know, when when you're talking with these people, I just love to learn from that. So that's why I started my podcast, you know, and it's fun and I get some, I get flow from it. Uh, so I wanted to make my podcast better. I wanted to figure out like, how could I ask better questions? How could I get the guests to better open up to, to add the value? So I went to the cruise and you know what, like John Lee Dumas and a lot of the other people there, they gave great training and is a lot of fun. It was expensive, you know, but when you have the wealth, the financial independence, guess what? You can go have experiences like this. You can go, you go, you can charter the, the boat and go swimming around and doing the snorkeling with, with your buddies. You can go and like, you can live epic. It's that freedom and flexible lifestyle. Like we're trying to get on this show. Yeah. I, I look at it, time, money, location, those are kind of the three things you have to balance, you know, partner at a law firm tied down to location tied down in terms of time. Someone else is setting his schedule, the judge with the docket. Like, do you want that? I don't know. As you're speaking here, I'm actually remembering something. So you and I met at the first Latin American Bitcoin conference two years ago in Buenos Aires. And I sat next to you at a lunch and you were telling me some of these concepts. I should look into it and, and start learning about this and, and figure out how it can benefit my life. Confession. I haven't done that even though I know I should have and I've thought about it a few times and as we're talking about it now, I'm f feeling guilty. You're one of the first people to really uh, start advocating Bitcoin publicly and saying, hey, this is going to work. You've obviously taken things and, and you, you learn about them and you, you're, you're an early adopter. You see something that you're curious about and you, and you do it. What strategies do you employ to you know, go from A to B and not say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Maybe I'll think about doing that. I'll put, file it away in my list. I just have a relentless pursuit for innovation and for knowledge, you know, so I'm always just like a dog digging after the bone, like trying to find something helpful for me. Found like bulletproof coffee. I didn't drink the coffee, but you'd stick this butter and MCT oil. And next thing you know, you got all these fats that your brain need. And you also get to stay in ketosis until like the middle of the afternoon. So, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff like that. You just have to, Tim Ferriss's book, you know, you just got, you have to engage in the experimentation on your own and you, you have to have the desire to do it. You know, at the end of the day, like if you don't have the desire to do it, then I, I guess it's just not that important for you. You know, <laughs> I mean, and, and who am I to, to like tell somebody what should be important for them? You know, I don't, I try not to give anybody advice on their money, uh, and not really too much on their health. I, you know, I tell people what I do myself, but it's still, it's very much an experiment. And, you know, I wish we could trust like our, our medical industrial complex, but I just, the economics are just not set up to do that you know it's it's really the sickness industry not the not the health industry they're very reactive it's not about proactively preventing issues or there, there's not a lot of money to be made doing that you know you need to sell a pill and then you need to upsell somebody to to get like three or four more pills for the side effect for, that was caused by the first pill so i mean the economics just aren't really there uh for health you know to really get people to be in this optimal state you know, so we, I think we have to be skeptical of a lot of, uh, you know, we got we have to be skeptical of whether they're evil and conspiring men or whether they're just seeking a profit motive or whether it's a combination of the two. I think we have to be cognizant. We need to be skeptical of a lot of stuff, too. You and I are on a panel tomorrow talking about VC investment internationally. Uh, you've invested in a number of companies and probably looked skeptically at many more. What tactics do you use for investing your money, both from the the uh, viewpoint of as an, as an entrepreneur, what should you be focusing on to make yourself attracted to VCs, you know, make yourself economically viable? And then what are you using? How do you sift through the, the different projects out there? There's got to be some type of a pain point that whatever the product or services that, that a consumer would hire and pay for, uh, you know, it's got to meet there. So like in my Bitcoin investments, for example, there's seven different network effects. The first one's speculation. In order to speculate, you need to be able to secure the Bitcoins. So I invested in Armory, which is a wallet to secure the Bitcoins. Once people have Bitcoins secured and they want to trade them or speculate on them, you need an exchange. So I invested in Kraken, which is the exchange. People also want to spin them. So, you know, the second network effect is merchants. So I invested in BitPay. Uh, so, you know, I try to have a very logical, coherent thought process to, like, why I'm investing in something, how it fits into a larger overall picture and strategy. It's very speculative type of stuff. 
And so it, it should only compose uh, a certain portion or percentage of the portfolio. Me personally, I like to have maybe a third of my, uh, a third of my assets and uh, liquid assets you know, whether they're stocks, blue chip type stocks or gold, silver, whatever, out of the, the liquid assets, I like to have maybe 10% in gold and silver, uh, you know, another few percent in bitcoins, maybe more. I don't have any Bitcoin, right? <laughs> That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Well, and you know, you, you when the price runs up, you want to sell some because it's getting overvalued. When it's undervalued, you want to be buying some. Uh, I also like, you know, I like passive income like i own some o realty for example their triple net lease uh publicly traded company pays a nice dividend every month because you, you have to you also have to understand how the cash flows in the financial statement and so if you're the ceo of your life i mean in the corporate world most of your ceos come out of finance and accounting and then also out of marketing so sales sales is a huge skill that you need to have and being able to count the beans is another huge, huge skill that you got to have. And so you look at your income and, and I actually divide it between active income and passive income, you know, active income where I'm actually, actually out there having to work to bring it in and passive income where it's, you know, it comes in whether I'm working on it or not. Then I look at expenses and I try to subordinate my expenses to my passive income because I like to measure net worth in terms of days. I like to measure it in the num in terms of the number of days that I can maintain my current standard of living without working, right? So I actually like to measure net worth in terms of days, not in terms of dollars. And so you keep expenses down. You have you have the active and passive income. Then when it gets to the balance sheet, you have assets, liabilities, owner's equity. You know, I don't want liabilities. I want assets. I want things that that generate more income for me. And I want to get rid of the liabilities or the expenses that I've got, you know, and I don't really like debt at all. And so that's how I like the cash to flow. I like income expenses. I like to consume less than I make. I take that excess. I plow it into assets that generate more, more income for me. And you know, that's, that's the recipe for wealth. You know, it's really not complicated. It's fairly simple. You know, you just have to get your nose to the grindstone and be building it. So we've covered three of the four pillars of the lifestyle design trace. We've covered health, wealth, and experiences. Tell me a bit more about the last pillar, relationships. Yeah, so relationships are, you know, just a huge, huge part of the human experience. You know, whether it's our relationships with a significant other, whether it's our family relationships, our relationships with uh, children, if we have any children. Um, then we have our personal relationships with our friends. We've got our business relationships. We've got our colleagues uh, in those types of areas. You know, all of these are areas where we can where we can grow as individuals by helping other people, by being motivated by love for other people, sincerely like wanting them to also have an optimal human experience if they choose it so that they can live epic, you know, and being happy for people when, when they do that. I've had, I've had quite a few relationships, for example, that might be uh, romantic relationships, but they, for whatever reason, we go our separate paths and they might end up with someone else and they've gotten married in some cases. I am happy as a clam for them, you know, and they've got their children and, and, and everything. And so, you know, we, we have to really, we have to be able to understand like what motivates and guides us and like, why do we do the things that we do and how can we live, you know, with this peace and happiness and harmony, both with ourselves and with others. You know, because I think a lot of the problems is people are not at peace and at harmony with themselves, and then they go and make a mess out of the relationships that they have with other people, and that leads to a lot of unhappiness. Yeah, I find that even in my own experiences in younger years that I was more concentrated externally trying to build fulfilling relationships with other people instead of concentrating on being the CEO of my own life and building that relationship with m me through physical health, mental health achieving wealth, you know, getting experiences, traveling the world. And then, then once I have all of that, I am able to really create relationships externally, mutually beneficial relationships based off of vulnerability. Like you were saying, you know, ba based off of compassion, based off of love. And I think that this is very similar to the entrepreneurial life as well. What does the entrepreneurial entrepreneur do? Well, he's looking in society and trying to identify, he or she is looking in society and trying to identify pains that other people have 
and solving those pains. Yes, for a lot of it's for monetary reasons, but you're not just going to get people aren't just going to give you their money. Like if you're solving a pain and creating more freedom or an easier lifestyle for other people, that is compassionate. A lot of people uh, probably through schooling of some sort have this strange idea that of the greedy capitalist or the greedy entrepreneur, luckily entrepreneur, the word entrepreneur doesn't have near the negative taint that capitalist does. But what are we doing? We're trying to solve problems. We're trying to solve problems for you. How can we make your life better? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and the, the, People, people pay, you know, that pay, people pay for stuff. That's how they value one thing over another. That's how you really discriminate some between like what matters to somebody, what they're willing to pay for. That's, that's the scorecard for how well an entrepreneur is serving people. But, you know, everything isn't just about money. That's just one way that we can, we can derive self-worth or value in general. You know, so, I mean, some of the best people I know, like they're poor as church mice. Like my grandmother, you know, she, she raised 10 kids without even electricity or running water. But she, in turn, if I were to like put people up there in terms of like who I really value as a role model, like I value her way, way more than I do, say, Warren Buffett. Making money, business, I mean, it's fine. You know, it, it's a good thing to do. And you can get a lot of flow from it. But it is it is not the end-all, be-all of the human condition. Yeah, and a good entrepreneur is able to see value for value's sake. Maybe I see someone that I can trust for something. Maybe I know someone I can depend on. Maybe I see some human talent that I can hire. Seeing value outside of just monetary value is so, so important. And that's, you know, it really makes you wonder, like, well, what are we doing on this planet, <laughs> right? Like, why are we here? How are we supposed to grow? What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, if we're trying to accomplish anything, you know, maybe it's very Zen or very, you know, Buddhist or Tao. Or, I mean, there there's a lot of different philosophies out there that we can use to kind of be our Polaris uh, for designing our lifestyle. I think it comes down to, you know, the relationships the, 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 the degree or the capacity of love that we can have for other people and what we do about that. Me personally, I'm, you know, I'm very logical, I'm very analytical, but I also have that aspect to my personality also. And I think that that's very important to, to have. And when we're interacting in our relationships with other people, I, I also kind of see four different pillars, like on how we connect. There's like our physical connection, there's our emotional connection, our intellectual connection and our uh, spiritual slash philosophical connection you know and you might you know if, if it's just a business colleague you you mainly might be only connecting uh, intellectually you know or you might be connecting intellectually and philosophically you know if you're a bunch of Bitcoin libertarians for example um, but you know if you're if you want that rom romantic uh, type of connection, then you want bo all four of them, right? That's how you're really going to to get in and have a, like a very deep, uh, satisfying relationship. You know, the more of those that we can have in our life, well, I guess it's not necessarily more. It's the, it's like the depth. Yeah, it's the depth of it because you know when you when you do have one specific person to focus on to focus your time and your attention and to really care about it's kind of like a laser uh, you're able to really focus that time and attention and uh and the growth and development that you get out of that but you know to to each their own in terms of lifestyle design you know that's why when i really don't like the state getting involved in personal relationships because we, I mean, we don't know. Humans are very complex creatures. We don't know, like, what drives people in their relationships. Like, you know, why why is a state, like, involved in these things, making such a mess out of them and yeah. such controversy? Yeah, how do they know what's going to make us happy? We're good to know internally, just personally, what's going to make us happy. The state has no clue. It's a severe knowledge problem on their part. Well, yeah, not only severe knowledge, going back to Frederick Hayek, but also they don't care. What, like, when did the state ever care about the happiness or the health or the wealth of their citizens? I mean, it wasn't anarchists who gassed millions of people in Germany. You know, it's not the anarchists who are over there uh, blowing stuff up in Syria right now. You know, it's not... There are a lot of things that the anarchists didn't do that the statists have done. The, the statists are very, very, very dangerous to people 
and their in the lifestyle design that individuals might want to have in determining their own individual autonomy, whether that's freedom of association, whether that's freedom of speech. You know, as, as a CEO we, we of our own life, we have to look at this in a, I think, also in a practical way. Um, a good example is Ross Albrecht, you know, convicted of trafficking drugs with the Silk Road, sentenced to life. Guess what? His lifestyle design got a serious crimp in it. He had a master's degree in, like, physics or something. Uh, came from same, a, a relatively good middle-class home. I actually went to the trial, you know. 14, it was, I went to, like, 14 of the 20 days or whatever the trial was. All these people marching in, like, oh, he was loved by his parents, blah, 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 all this stuff, right? And I'm like, why, why would somebody who's seemingly could do anything that they want in their life, why would they do that? You know, maybe it's an evolutionary thing. You know, the the mouse uh, that evades the cat, like the mouse has to get into flow to evade the cat, right? And the cat has to get into flow to catch the mouse. And so at the end of the day, like Ross was playing the mouse and he chose the, 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 the role of the mouse. And he got caught by the cats. Because there's cats out there. Because they get flow. They get, they get flow and they get paid to be cats. And you, you have to understand that, you know, and take that into account when you're, when you're deciding how to channel your own human capital. There's a book by uh, Harvard Business Press called The Outsiders. It's about the eight CEOs that have just generated completely outsized returns for shareholders. You know, Warren Buffett, the CEO of Teledyne Continental, uh, the CEO of Washington Post, Catherine Graham, goes through it all. And at the end of the day, it wasn't necessarily that these CEOs picked the best companies or picked the best industries or even operated their companies the best way. What made the big distinguishing difference in the performance of the CEOs was their ability as capital allocators. And that's really what we're doing when we're CEOs of our own life. We're deciding how to allocate our capital. First, let's understand we should allocate our capital to generate more flow. And when we go to generate flow, let's not get addicted to the dark side of the flow like Albrecht did or like some of these extreme sports athletes do. You know, And, they, and so they jump off of some crazy helicopter skiing, spine mountain, triple backflip, dead. Like, yeah. You know, because what they're doing is they're seeking flow because when when the challenge is about 2% more than your skill or ability, that's the optimal level to get into flow. If, if the challenge is too high, you're going to feel anxious. If it's too low, you're going to feel bored. You know, understand that and have multiple different hobbies, you know. Find somebody to do tango dancing with and find, you know, and, and pick up scuba diving and maybe do some mathematics and, and learn how to code, do some computer coding, co which actually is a huge flow-inducing activity because you're basically playing Legos with words, right? So, you know, there's a lot to just being the CEO of our life and figuring out how we want to design it and, and able to get that optimal human experience. Yeah, and live epic. I mean, we got to live epic. So many of my friends are like, oh, what do you think of this TV show? And I'm just like... <laughs> I've had a TV for over a decade. I, I literally haven't had a TV since I moved out at, at uh, out of my parents' house, which I left early to go to college. Like, I haven't had a TV. Like, I don't watch TV. Why? When would I ever have time to watch TV? No way. I mean, do you really think I would I would know about Bitcoin and start publicly talking about it at a nickel if I was sitting around watching TV? Yeah. So, so let's talk about that because you were one of the first guys to recognize Bitcoin as value, even when the marketplace wasn't placing a lot of value in it, uh, monetarily speaking. Talk to us about the early days of Bitcoin and how you got into it. Yeah, I mean, I just ran across it on the internet, but you know, a lot of it was... I had I had spent a lot of time and a lot of effort studying a lot of different subjects. I mean, Bitcoin is computer science and cryptography and economics and and thermodynamics and freedom and Austrian school of economics and monetary theory and monetary science. Like there's a lot to Bitcoin and a lot to understanding it, yeah, especially in those early days. You know, even the people that should have gotten it, they didn't. Yeah, like me. It took me till 2013. Well, I mean, I'm talking about people like Dr. Adam Back. You know, he, he got emailed by Satoshi, you know, and with the white paper. Like, hey, what, what should I put in this white paper? And, and Adam, Dr. Back's like, oh, well, you know, you should put something in there about Wade I and B money and like gave him some citations for it. And yet Dr. Back says that, you know, he kind of left Bitcoin alone for 18 months and then finally kind of came back to it because 
because he had been working on this for like decades, you know? And so it, Bitcoin is just such a kind of a fascinating uh, experience uh, that people have kind of, everybody's got their own experience with it. I think everybody's realized, you know, I like buying gold because nobody's ever gone broke owning gold. Gold has never gone to zero. It does fluctuate in price, but it's never gone to zero. Guess what? Nobody's gone broke owning Bitcoin. Since That's came. right. You know, it, it's been a fun roller coaster. Like, don't get me wrong. It's been a fun roller coaster. You, you know. said you started at five cents? Yeah, five cents. It's run up to like $32 and crashed to $2 and ran up to $266 and crashed to $60 and ran up to $1,200 and crashed to $180. I mean, don't get me wrong. It is a lot of fun to chase the rabbit, you know? But but we have to we have to put it all in context. We, all, we have to put it all... We have to allocate that capital, and we have to figure out what we're after, right? Like, because if a thousand dollars isn't enough, is ten thousand? Is a hundred thousand? Is a million? Ten million? Is that enough? I think a lot of people go after trying to accumulate wealth and acquiring things, you know, things that own them instead of them owning the things. They do it out of, you know, there, there's some deep rooted or deep seated psychological issue that they need to work on themselves and overcome. And until they do that, you know, they're just going to be kind of running around on this hamster wheel and it, and they're not going to get the flow. They're not going to get the optimal human experience that they otherwise could have. Yeah. It comes back to being your own life CEO and hopefully going down and learning your relationship with your own health and your own wealth and your experiences and yourself first, right? Because if you don't take the time to be the CEO of your life, you're going to find a lot of confusion and a lot of difficulty externally when you try to start controlling things outside of your control if you can't even take the time or the discipline to control the things that you can. Yeah, I mean, you don't have discipline over yourself. What makes you think you can have discipline over someone else? Which, you know, status, uh, uh, I mean, really, like... (laughs) So, Trace, I, I, I know that we're here at the Latin American Bitcoin Conference and you've got a ton of people that want to talk to you. Do you have any type of encouragement or advice that you'd like to give either young entrepreneurs or possibly uh, libertarians looking for another outlet to find personal freedom? Go, one would be watch uh, Steve Jobs' Stanford commitment, commencement address. I think that that's great. Uh, he, he makes a statement in there, you can't connect the dots looking forward only looking backwards you know i think that there is significant scientific evidence or unexplained phenomenon under our current laws of physics that will help shed light on like why we're here you know there there's a book called the holographic universe that i'd highly recommend uh, reading there's also a book called life before life which talks about uh reincarnation it's two mds at the university of virginia and they've they've accumulated a bunch of uh, stories which you know become very compelling scientific evidence for reincarnation out of the 2700 there are 200 of these stories where the the person who remembered the previous life and all these otherwise unexplainable details also has a birthmark that matches in a in some type of way the way that the previous person died and so we don't we don't necessarily know like how consciousness functions whether it does continue after uh, the physical body dies whether it re-inhabits another physical body like what like why it continues to do this we we don't know a lot of these answers um, we we also don't understand how the universe itself works you know we've got Newtonian physics we've got Einsteinian theory of relativity but you know now we're we're getting into like non-local particles and and some of this stuff which you know we've got unexplained phenomena and so we don't understand how the even the universe itself works let alone like dark matter and how that interacts with everything so you know we i think we've we've seen a lot of advances from the age of reason and from the age of science uh but you know with the heisenberg uncertainty principle and the observer effect uh, you know, our, our current, our usual scientific method where we have an experiment that can be replicated by somebody else, that might not necessarily be valid in all cases because what if, uh, what if the observer does change or cause a change in the observed? Well, now, now we've got unexplained phenomena that could other, like, like how that work, right? I mean, there, there's a movie that came out six months ago called The Cokeville Miracle, 
you know, go go watch that and try to figure out what the scientific explanation is for it because it's pretty unbelievable. It's very straightforward in in the assertions of its facts, but wildly revolutionary in how we understand the state and the functioning of the universe. And so, you know, we we have to. I think we have to kind of ponder some of these deeper philosophical questions in order to figure out like what do we want to accomplish out of our life and I do think in a lot of ways that we all have a life that that we design for ourselves, right coming back to the CEO role again coming back to the CEO role like looking at all this the scientific evidence if a consciousness does exist before it was born maybe it did design a life maybe it did design a purpose and so when we get down here maybe that's what part of our growth is is trying to figure out what that purpose was that we designed for ourselves because we have something in this kind of much longer term perspective that we have to work on and we have to develop and so we designed our this this potential life map for ourselves and then we get down here and you know what if you design something for yourself and you sit around watching tv like great now you get to do it again yeah and i and i I think that's great advice because we've given you know four different pillars of you creating the lifestyle so that you can go out and find you know what is my purpose right you're you're setting yourself up for success if you do concentrate on your health wealth experiences and relationships and and steve jobs you know he talked about this you can't connect the dots looking backwards but you have to find your own inner voice that already knows what it wants to do. You just, you just have to be present enough to listen like, to it. Yeah, you have to be present enough to listen to it. You got to kind of, you know, you got to take control of your own situation. It's probably not going to be easy. But you know what? So, some, the first guy who climbed Mount Everest, he was asked, like, why'd you climb it? He's like, because it's there. You know what? It's not easy. You know, we don't do things because they're easy. We do things because they're hard. I mean, life, like, we're going to climb it. I mean, that's what's so much, so fun about this, you know? Like, we have these completely unexplored vistas, vistas that are totally unique to each of us because we each have our own lifestyle design that we can, that we can craft. Let's climb it. And we don't climb it because it's easy. We climb it because it's hard. Because it's epic. We climb it because it's epic. And you know what? If it was easy, it wouldn't be worth it. Right. It wouldn't be rewarding. Trace Mayer, amazing podcast today. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Would you like to plug anything or give contact details? No, not really. <laughs> All right. Well, just, you know, everybody just live epic. You know, just, just live epic. You heard it here, guys. Live epic. Thank you so much, Trace. Thank you to Trace Mayer. This interview was conducted by Ash and Justin, edited by Justin.